Thank you for joining us today for our April mini webinar, Hazard Prevention and Control, Proactive Management for Controlling Hazards. Today we actually have a guest speaker that we'd like to welcome. Um, Brent Bryden is CEO of Interactive Safety Solutions and is a certified OSHA safety instructor for the National Safety Education Center at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. And he's also a trainer for the National Safety Council. Brent has 33 years of manufacturing, environmental health and safety experience, and we're very excited to have him here with us today. So before we jump into Brent's material, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of Rockford Systems. We provide turnkey safeguarding solutions for organizations working with industrial machinery. Rockford Systems is a private company founded in 1971 and is located in Rockford, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Our services range from training and education, like today's webinar, to machine safeguarding and risk assessment, to uh, installations and post-sale support. We also provide ongoing compliance validation and sell over 10,000 safeguarding products, many of which can be viewed on our website. So please visit recordsystems.com to learn more about us and follow us on social media. And now I will turn the presentation over to Brent. Well, good morning, Carrie. Thank you. And thank you to all that are out there listening. It's a pleasure to be here at Rockford Systems. Uh, we're going to jump right into what some of our goals and objectives are going to be for today. Uh, we want to provide you with an understanding of how to become more proactive and less reactive as it is with your injuries, accidents, and near misses in your organization, and how to strengthen your safety programs in order to be able to do that. Uh, we also want to take a look at uh, what does, and we want you to be able to answer the questions, what does your safety program really look like? Um, you need to sometimes take a very hard look at are you overwhelmed with laws, regulations, signage, and, and quite frankly, the egos in, in an organization? Uh, is your training inconsistent, outdated, dusty, and torn, or, or missing from uh, your safety training department? And are your videos and banners outdated collecting dust, which basically tells folks that, uh, you know, we haven't been interested in safety enough to uh, keep all this information to where it is relevant, up to date, and, uh, you know, being maintained and or sustained. So these items can show, uh, you know, your particular programs. Um, they can look like you are tired. Uh, in your programs and no one is clearly sustaining the program and it appears not to be a priority in your business. We also com combined with that have a lot of common excuses in the marketplace and you know uh, we don't have the time for this or we're small enough that we really uh, aren't worried about safety. We've never had a problem. Nobody's ever got hurt here. Uh, we've never had a claim. Uh, we've tried and failed and um, you know we've offered a lot of this and a lot of that programs called flavor of the day programs um, uh, they're hurried and ill-researched and you know essentially um, you know, they've allowed you to be set up to fail in these particular programs when it comes to uh, initiating some of these programs we need to be honest with ourselves we need to be honest with our employees and uh, you know, quite frankly, as an employer, we need to be honest with all the above. We have to ask ourselves, is our safety program really working? And if it isn't, why isn't it? Um, which brings us to, you know, if it is, how do we keep it going? And if no, why do we continue to keep it going? Um, we're really throwing a lot of money at programs that aren't working. Uh, so you need to understand what it is and where it is, uh, you know, in your organization. If yes, what actions do we take to maintain and sustain these particular programs? And is it okay to fail? Well, only if you learn from it. Let's talk about failure and motivation. When it pertains to uh, safety and health and environmental concerns in a business, 
our failures in motivation are really reinforced by citations, um, uh, workman's comp, and as well as injuries and illnesses and accidents in the, in the workplace. We need to learn to take failures and we need to develop a mechanism for pursuing them into perfections. We're using them as benchmarks to move forward, at the same time, creatively channeling that motivation and making the most of that failure going forward. How do we do this as an organization depends on the continuity of the top-down, bottom-up management model. So how do we become proactive and what is proactive versus reactive? Well, proactive is seeking to understand and how do we implement corrective actions? How do we look at the certain behaviors and how do we get the negative outcome out of um, our business that is going to affect our employees? When we react to something, it's usually that an injury, an illness, an accident, or a near miss has happened. We've sustained property damage, product damage, but most importantly, we've had people damage. Um, we have to seek to understand and implement those corrective actions through um, you know, instrumental programs and understand the behaviors behind those after a negative outcome affecting our employees occurs. Whenever we introduce or have introduced into the business, we need uh, different safety and health orientation concepts. We need to make sure that people understand what it is they're working with and why they're working with it. And we look at orientations as important so that people can understand the hazards that they're gonna be exposed to and how do we prevent them from coming in contact with the harmful agents or processes uh, for themselves and others that may be in the adjacent areas. We also look at safety and health programs as being recommended for all general industry operations, but at this point, we look at these as being voluntary. However, voluntary they are, we still have certain elements that are actually governed by the General Duty Clause and governed by the 1910 Code of Federal Regulations and other regulatory agencies that you may be affiliated with. The best safety and health programs, however, involve every level of an organization from the top down to the bottom up. They instill safety cultures, they reduce incidents, they allow people to have a voice in uh, how to report an accident, what is this, what is this process actually uh, doing to us and for us as it relates to in the safety and health of the worker. And in doing this together, increases the profits of an organization, reducing the amount of expense that are incurred with indirect and direct costs. Are safety programs good for business? And are they a good business practice? Well, yes, they are. They're not just an add-on program. They're a very uh, centered program by themselves. Um, accidents are more expensive than people actually understand and some costs such as workman's comp and other lawsuits and other things that can come out of these are actually uh, raise that cost of the injured or ill worker long term. But it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we have those hidden and, uh, hidden and direct costs as we look into and train and pay for additional workers to cover for those workers that may, um, you know, be sent home as a result of their injury, having modified duty and different things to that, which we can try, but may not always be able to accommodate. We always look at the repair of damaged property, which it's not getting any cheaper to repair property um, product. And most importantly, it's not that expensive or not that cheap anymore to, to fix our people. It takes time to investigate the accidents and do a thorough job so that we can look and guarantee or put certain assurances in place that it doesn't happen again uh, in a single location, but also as a best practice across an entire lo uh, business unit as well. We also look at the pain and the quality of life for the injured worker. This directly affects not only the worker, but the families of the workers and the quality of social involvement that they would have going forward, which in turn, does decrease morale. So we have some certain characteristics of an effective safety and health program. 
management needs to believe that safety and health on the job is important. It is an important corporate goal and company goal. It's not just a marketing concept. Um, we look at such cost controls, quality and productivity objectives um, as a, uh, a method and a means and a mode in order to carry this out. Individuals in the organization need to believe they have the right to a safe and healthful workplace, and we have to believe that we're doing everything we can to be able to provide that for them. Each person in the organization, from the top down to the bottom up, needs to accept personal responsibility for ensuring that they have, uh, for his and her own sake, a very uh, conscious objective of safety and health, not only for themselves, but for their coworkers. They need to be able to have the freedom to sustain uh, this level of participation to, quite frankly, be able to report things that are not right and to be involved in making things uh, safe and continue uh, in the business. Employees believe that they have the duty to protect others uh, of their safety and health, and once empowered, they become a very successful and motivating source in your business. Management's commitment and employee involvement, they need to be committed. They need to provide certain resources, both time and money, but more than likely, um, they also have to be able to lead um, and be involved with the employee at the same level, and they're tied together. They're not effective without each other. A manager can be totally committed, but if the employees follow blindly and they're not involved, problems will only be temporary. Um, uh, problems will only temporarily be solved, and they may continue on for a long period of time as well. Management must be provided. Motivation and resources um, need to be, you know, given towards these particular uh, initiatives. And as we do so, management commitment allows workers to develop and express their involvement in which ways that um, they can participate, whether it's how machines work or what's going on, what's wrong, how can we improve processes along the way. So who's responsible? Well, hopefully when you ask that question in your organization, uh, everybody gives you the same answer that they are responsible for their safety and the safety of others. Um, they're responsible for what goes on in the participation level of their safety and health programs as you have given that to them, but also making sure that the programs must have reasonable authority to disperse certain or make available certain resources such as time, money, um, you know, et cetera, a place to meet, a way to communicate. Um, so managers, supervisors, and employees, you know, can hold that accountability. They need to be able to go and at least annually evaluate and identify deficiencies in a program um, or series of programs or deficiencies in training and knowledge-based stuff, uh, information, and revise it as needed. They define the program objectives. You know, are you what are you trying to accomplish with your programs? Fewer work-related incidents, fewer sick days. Do we want healthier, happier employees? Do we want better morale and increased productivity? Um, protection from OSHA fines and reduce work comp costs, but also improved employee relations. And hopefully you're gonna be looking at, yes, we want all those objectives to be met. So how do we get started with the program? We have to follow four key indicators. We have to be able to identify it before we can do something with it. We need to be able to make predictions on if we do this, this will happen. If this happens, then this will happen. And we need to be able to decide and execute upon some of those predictions and decisions in order to eliminate problems in our processes and our programs as it relates to safety and health. Management commitment is primary um, as they are the ones that help us set policies and have clear-cut goals and objectives. We need to be able to have visible, visible management leadership in order we need to walk the walk and talk the talk. Uh, we need to be held accountable. Um, our employee involvement, we need to hold them accountable. Uh, they will hold us accountable. We have the assignment of responsibilities and also the authority and resources through some of those assignments and responsibilities 
as well as accountability and program evaluations. In other words, how are we doing right now and how much better do we want to be um, in the future? One way to do this is to understand everything and have a comprehensive hazardous identification or hazard identification in the business. We do this by understanding what we have and as it relates to the interaction of man and machine uh, in the facilities, but we do this through conditional reporting called site inspections and doing this on a regular basis. We also have a method and provide a method for hazard reporting and training folks in how to report hazards is, is key, um, possibly stopping it before it stops one of our employees. We look at accidents and incident investigations as well. Uh, what are some of the findings for this? And what are some of the remedies that we can use across our business units? We also have the ability to look at our injury and illness trends from lagging data and indicators that are showing that uh, if we continue to go in this same method and mode and path, um, our trend will be much like this. And we can use this to identify, predict, decide, and execute stage in the, here as well. Having the appropriate hazard prevention and control, we look at different preventative maintenance strategies, we look at different emergency preparedness strategies, educating, practicing uh, our methods of egress and um, hazards, uh, chemical spills, and how do we get people effectively from one area of a building out to the next, um, free and clear of certain emergencies, and should we have any medical issues within our facilities, preparing ourselves and having a program to respond to our employees' needs as well. We can start this by determining if the hazards in fact actually exist or have the potential to exist, and where feasible, prevent hazards by effective design and job, at the job and or job sites. Um, if the hazard can't be eliminated, what are some of the hazard controls that we're going to use, either engineering controls to engineer the hazard out, some admin controls, whether it's training, signage, or process, and then down into the last resource of being uh, providing of the uh, PPE or personal protective equipment. Eliminating and controlling hazards in a timely manner um, is key. It shows that there's a level of commitment uh, and it is taken extremely uh, serious as well. Safety and health training for all, uh, employees, temps, and supervisors and managers. At every level of the business, we are the employees of the business, um, whether we're the supervisor or the manager or the uh, person just doing uh, work for those entities. We all are those employees. We need to understand who we need to train, what is the content of the training, what is our mission, what are we trying to, uh, to achieve, and then when is a good time to do the training? And why are we actually doing this training? What is our motivation? What is part of our goal and objective to get folks trained? And then how do we find the right training outlet and the right information? Safety and training is the backbone of, a, of any of your um, safety and health systems. Um, it also gives management uh, for management to lead the employees to analyze. It gives them the ability to participate and help and get involved. Um, and the scope of training depends on the size and the complexity of the worksite um, and the different hazards that are involved. Target new hires. Contract workers, employees who wear PPE and workers in high-risk areas. Uh, managers and supervisors should be included in the training program. Again, we're trying to create a continuity of knowledge. Uh, manager training should emphasize their importance, their role, and their visibility um, in how they're supporting safety and health programs, and also by setting a good example. Specific training needs, when we drill this down a little bit further, is hazard recognition. We're also looking at the training required that is in the standards that are set by the Code of Federal Regulations and the federal government. Also, the emergency response and accident investigation and emergency drills that uh, we don't always get to use in our businesses, and that's a good thing, but they still need to be uh, at a heightened awareness 
so that we can uh, begin to uh, you know, act upon those as needed in an efficient, effective manner on behalf of the employee safety. Examples where employee involvement is beneficial is getting people involved in the inspection and hazard analysis teams, as well as developing and revising safe work rules uh, and making sure that we're clean, clear, and concise on the message we're trying to create and roll out following our creation of these programs. Training new hires and coworkers and allowing people to assist us in accident investigations also brings a continuity to the program as well. Employees must commit to safety and health protection for themselves and others in their workplace, and then encourage employees to get involved in the program and in the decisions that affect their safety and health. Managers need to understand their safety and health responsibilities um, as described back in the management commitment employee involvement elements of the guidelines. They need to be able to work and help and analyze work uh, to identify potential hazards and understand where the hazards exist and why, and then maintain physical protections in the work area, and again, providing resources um, for those, time, materials, money, uh, and the like. We need to reinforce that employee training through performance feedback. How are we doing? How are our trends performing? And if needed, enforcement of safe work practices um, may be needed as well. In summary, effective worker safety and health programs really do reduce work-related injuries and illnesses. They improve the morale and productivity of the particular uh, business unit, as well as they strive and will reduce uh, work compensation, workers' compensation costs. We have to look inside and work within the four elements of managing uh, the management commitment, employee involvement, the worksite analysis process, what do we have, and, and identifying certain uh, hazards, and then being able to prevent those hazards and control those hazards based on those findings, and then training folks to identify, predict, decide, and execute what those hazards of preventions might be. Okay, well, thank you, Brent, for a very informative overview on hazard prevention and control. I'd like to remind everybody that we do offer training through Rockford Systems. We offer a two and a half day hands-on ANSI OSHA uh, machine safeguarding seminar at our headquarters training facility here in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, this is conducted one week every month and the schedule can be found on our website. We're also offering 10 and 30 hour OSHA classes and hazard communications classes. Again, those schedules can be found on our website. So please visit rockfordsystems.com slash training or rockfordsystems.com slash seminars to learn more about these exciting training options. We'd also like to invite you to our next webinar, which will be on May 29th. Roger Harrison will be back and he will be providing a 60 minute overview on machine safeguarding 101. You can sign up for this webinar on our website. Um, look for the uh, square in the upper right hand corner on the website for the webinar or go to uh, resources and find the, the uh, sign up link under webinars. Okay, thank you so much and have a great day.